Welcome to a new Carter Report series, The Game Changers. These rare individuals appear once in a lifetime, like a blazing meteor across the night sky. They change the course of history. They show us the way forward. Welcome to The Game Changers. Welcome back, my friends, to the great lady Game Changers. We've been talking about that fascinating character, Mary Magdalene, the ex-prostitute. I want you to notice something amazing about this lady, found in Mark chapter 14 and verses 3 to 9. Take your Bible, Matthew, Mark chapter 14 and verses 3 to 9. And being in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, the Pharisee, as he sat at the table, a woman came having an alabaster flask of very costly oil of spikenard, $50,000 worth. Then she broke the flask and poured it on his head. But there were some who were indignant among themselves and said, why was this fragrant oil wasted? Uh, for it might have been sold for more than 300 denarii years wages and given to the poor. And they criticized her sharply. But Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done good work for me. For you have the poor with you always, and whenever you wish you may do good to them. But me you do not always have. She has done what she could. Look, look at this. She has prepared my body beforehand to anoint my body for burial. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial. I want you to notice something that most folks don't get. I, I never got it. She broke the alabaster vase. That sounds like an, an awful waste to me. An alabaster vase uh, is worth a lot of money. Why did she do this? Why did she break the alabaster vase? Did you know this? At a Jewish funeral, at the ceremony, when they would anoint the corpse with oil, they broke the vase. And then they put the vase with the corpse in the coffin. Jesus said, let her alone. She broke it because she knows I'm going to the cross. But nobody else got it. The men didn't get it. Remember Peter? He said, this is not going to happen to you, Lord. When the men didn't get it, when the apostles didn't get it, the ex-prostitute got it. What does that tell you? It tells you about the grace of God. She had a heart for God because the gospel was revealed to her. I'm going to say something to you. You're either going to get this or else it's going to wash over your head. Some of you are just not going to comprehend it. But some of you will. The truth of the gospel of Christ is a mystery. It is not only taught from the pulpit, it is revealed supernaturally by the Holy Spirit. And if it isn't supernaturally revealed to you, you will be a hard-hearted uh, Pharisee in the church. The men didn't get it. But the ex-prostitute got it. You know why she got it? She felt her need. She and the other women took care of Jesus out of their own means. When Jesus and his ragtag army came into town, Mary was there, mentioned first. When the disciples ran away, Mary was there. Mark 15, 39 to 41. Look at this text. 
So when the centurion who stood opposite him saw that he cried out like this and breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the son of God. There were also women looking on from afar. Among them were, number one, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the less and Joses and Salome who had also followed him and ministered to him when he was in Galilee and many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. Um, Mary's there. When the men ran to the hills, Mary ran to the cross. She watched as he was laid in the tomb. She was at the cross. She was at the tomb. Mark 15, 46, 47. Then he brought fine linen. This is Joseph of Arimathea. Took him down and wrapped him in the linen. He laid him in a tomb which had been hewn out of the rock, rolled a stone, a great stone, against the door of the tomb. And Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joses, observed where he was laid. She was there at the tomb. She helped to prepare the oils to anoint his broken body. She had done it before. I'm not going to read it to you now because I don't have time. Nicodemus, one of the leaders of the Jews, not all the Jews crucified Christ. Nicodemus was a member of the Sanhedrin. He was a child of God. And he came out of the dark. He'd been a, a, a Christian. He'd been hiding in the dark. He came to Jesus by night. And he comes to anoint the Lord's body. And if you read it in many translations, like this one here, the New King James Version, it says uh, he brought a hundred pounds. If you work that out, it's spiking hard, it means uh, five million dollars worth. But it wasn't enough for Mary. You know why? Because on that Friday afternoon, she goes home and she prepares more. You know whom God loves? A generous person. You know a person who is closest to the devil in character? A Scrooge, a mean, a tight person. Have you met them? Maybe there are some here today. People who are tight. John 20 verse 1 says, John 20 verse 1. Now the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. She was first at the tomb, at the cross, the ex-prostitute. Think about it. She found him in the garden. She was the first person Christ spoke to, Mary. John 20, verses 10 to 16. Then the disciples went away again to their own homes, but Mary stood outside by the tomb, Weeping, it says in other translations, sobbing, sobbing. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb and she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. Then they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, because they've taken away my Lord and I do not know where they've laid him. Now when she had said this, She turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. Why? Because she's crying. People say, I don't want any emotion in my religion. Then you'll never have Christ. You'll be cold as a Pharisee. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, sir, If you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him and I will take him away. How? Jesus said to her, Maria. The ex-prostitute. Think about it. Mary anointed him to prepare for his death. On Friday, she prepared anointing oils for his broken body. If you read the Gospels, it says after the Sabbath on the Saturday night, I've missed this for years, she went out and bought some more. A hundred pounds is not enough. She was there at the cross. She was first at the tomb. 
She was first to bring, meet the resurrected Lord. She was the first to bring the disciples good news. She became the apostle to the apostles. That's why God loved her so much. He had a special love for Mary. Because Mary has got a heart like God. It's a generous heart. The Pharisee's heart is the heart of the devil. Some people say, oh, I couldn't do, I couldn't go, I can't do that. Then you're of your father, the devil. She, the ex-prostitute, was honored of heaven. She was redeemed and saved from a life of sin. She provided the Lord with food on his journeys. She anointed him with fragrant spices twice. She was with him when he died. She was first at the tomb. She was the first person to see him when he was resurrected, the first person to announce his resurrection. And hence, the ex-prostitute. It's one of the greatest game changers in history. The story of Mary tells us there is hope for every one of us. God save Mary. There's hope for you. His grace is greater than all our sins. The love of God saved Mary. But there's one thing that God finds it very hard to deal with, I want to tell you, and that is a self-righteous, harder heart. Those people put Christ on the cross. Mary was ahead of them all. Then there's Tabitha. Dorcas, the lady who was raised from the dead. Acts chapter 9, 36, 37. At Joppa, there was a certain disciple named Tabitha, which is translated Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and charitable deeds, which she did. But it happened in those days that she became sick and died. Good people die. When they'd washed her, they laid her in an upper room. In Arabic and Greek, her name means gazelle, an animal noted for its graceful movements and large, beautiful eyes. She was not famous for teaching or preaching. She was famous for kindness. Remember what the little girl said, dear God, make all the bad people good and all the good people kind. Are you a good person? Are you kind? God especially loves kind, generous people. When I was a student studying for the ministry, I was very poor. I worked full-time studying and also had to work long hours to pay for board and tuition costs. During vacation breaks, I worked selling books from door to door. Beverly did the same. She's followed a similar program. We don't regret it. We, it was good for us. and taught us the value of paying for what you get without government handouts. The winters at Avondale were cold. I did not have warm clothes or warm blankets. I was frequently sick. The Dorcas Society heard about this skinny boy who was freezing in his refrigerator cell at Avondale which is what we call it, Avon Jail. They made me a warm, thick bed cover and secretly delivered it. They delivered it when I was out working because I knew I didn't want handouts. I'd rather freeze. For the first time in a long time, I was warm at nights, and thank God for Dorcas. She gave me a handout. I'm all for handouts. I'm not for... I'm all for hand-ups. I'm not for handouts. God was so impressed with Dorcas, Tabitha, that he raised her from the dead. Didn't do that for too many people. Acts chapter 9, 40 and 41. But Peter put them all out and knelt down and prayed. Turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. She opened her eyes. When she saw Peter, she sat up. Then he gave her his hand, lifted her up. And when he'd called the saints and widows, he presented her alive. She must have been pretty special. God is not in the business of going around raising people up all the time. 
He'll do that at the resurrection. Since then, millions have been given a hand up by Dorcas societies around the world. The gazelle lady was a genuine lady game changer. And so was Phoebe, the ambassador of God to the city of Rome. Turn in your Bible, Romans 16, 1 and 2. Spurgeon said, weak Christians own Bibles and feed on newspapers. They'd say today, weak Christians own Bibles and watch television all the time and they've got nothing left between their ears. Romans 16, 1 and 2. I commend you Phoebe, our sister, who was a servant of the church in Syncrike, that you may receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints and assist her in whatever business she has need of, of you. For indeed she has been a helper of many and of myself also. Uh, Phoebe came from Corinth, or a little town next to Corinth, Syncrique. Uh, Corinth was one of the most wicked cities of the Roman world. Phoebe is actually named after the Greek moon goddess. It means radiant or bright. She was a leader of the church in Syncrique. Oh, a small town a few miles from Corinth. She is called in scripture, in the Greek, a diaconon or a deacon, also called a prostatus in the Greek. It means a benefactor. She must have had some money. Her church most likely was a home church. In those days, there were no buildings for churches. People say, oh, this is my church. What? Your church is made out of concrete? Church is made out of people. Don't you know that? The church most likely was raised up by Paul. Now listen to this. She was Paul's ambassador to the Romans. Rome, Rome was a big, wit, uh, wicked and dangerous place. It was ruled over by the tyrant, you know who? Nero. In those days, it was huge, being about a million in population. Half the children died by five years. It is full of violence, social unrest, depravity. At least half the people or more were slaves. Phoebe travels from Corinth to Rome. And, she, and that's a long trip. And she carries under her robe the book of Romans. Romans was written by Paul in Corinth where he probably stayed with Gaius. Romans 16.23 says, Gaius, my host, and the host of the whole church greets you. Arrestus, the treasurer of the city, greets you. And Quartus, a brother. He probably stayed with Gaius. And she carries Paul's magnum opus. And with Romans... She carries the future of the church and the future of the world. A woman does it. Romans, which is the most misunderstood and least understood book in the Christian church, is probably the most important book ever written. It shows how the sinner is legally made right with God. Romans 1, 16 and 17, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, Paul said. It is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written. The just shall live by faith. We are saved by the righteousness of God. What does it mean? Coming up soon, I'm going to talk about Paul and his book. Romans. This book, my American friends and the rest of you, started the Protestant Reformation that produced the great democracies and a mighty wave of freedom and prosperity around the world. There would have been no America without Paul 
and the book of Romans, and probably no book of Romans, delivered without this lady. God entrusted this book to Phoebe. It is through her that the church got hold of Romans that the British reformer Tyndale described as good, glad and merry tidings that makes a man's heart to sing for joy and his feet to dance. Why are there so many sour people who call themselves religious? It's because they've got religion but they haven't got the gospel. And the gospel is good, glad and merry tidings. Phoebe carried it. Thank God for Paul. Thank God for Phoebe. Now, Priscilla and Aquila. Or Prisca. Priscilla and Aquila. Priscilla was a woman who, with her husband Aquila, was one of the great leaders of the early Christian church. Romans 16, 3 and 4. Paul writes, writing from Corinth, these folks now are back in Rome. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their own necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Priscilla and Aquila. They originally came from Pontus on the Black Sea. Aquila was a Jew. We're not so sure about uh, his wife. Probably she was. One thing is certain, it appears she was the leader. <laughs> In a world dominated by men, one would expect her husband's name to come first. But not so, my dear friends. They are mentioned as a team seven times in the New Testament and Priscilla is mentioned first five times. You read it all off the screen? That's not fair. The Bible teaches the equality of the sexes and women are liberated by the gospel of Christ. They had been living in wicked old Rome but were forced to leave by the Emperor Claudius. Acts 18, 1 to 3. Acts 18. After these things, Paul departed from Athens, went to Corinth, and he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome and he came to them. So because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked for by occupation they were tent makers. And so Paul gets with them. <laughs> Paul had been taught a trade. They worked together making tents. Hard manual work is honourable. If a minister can't do hard honourable work, he's not going to be worth anything as a minister. Every Jewish boy was taught a trade. Paul, by trade, was a, a tent baker. As a boy of 16, I was taught how to drive a bulldozer. By trade, I'm a bulldozer driver. I worked 12 hours a day constructing a huge irrigation drain that was 60 feet deep. Hard, honest, manual work is great preparation for the ministry. Priscilla and her husband became Christians after working with Paul. What a man. Then they travelled with Paul to Ephesus. They were part of his team. They were special. Paul went on to the region of Galatia and Phrygia. Priscilla set up home in Ephesus. Then something of great significance and importance occurred. Apollos comes to Ephesus, he's a mighty preacher. He was a Jew mighty in the scriptures, but he didn't know the gospel. Acts chapter 18, 24 to 26. Now a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue when Aquila and Priscilla heard him. They took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. He was taught the gospel by Priscilla and Aquila. You don't have to be ordained by man to teach the word of God. Women say, 
you know, I just want to pray. Well, go ahead and preach, but win souls. You got to win souls. You got to build up, not pull down. Women can teach. Women can win, win souls. Dear old John Wesley, out on one of his evangelistic trips, and he heard that his mother was teaching and preaching. He got back and he said, you got to stop this. She said, no, my boy, because God has called me to preach the word. And this woman was called to preach the word. Uh, Apollos went on to become one of the greatest preachers in the church. It was Priscilla who showed the way. She had a church in her own house. It says that in 1 Corinthians 16, 19. It says that, 1 Corinthians chapter, the churches of Asia greet you, Aquila and Priscilla greet you heartily in the Lord with the church that is in their house. So they had a church. And on one occasion, they risked their lives for Paul. Maybe it was the riot in Ephesus. Often revivals are accompanied by riots. If you can't have a revival, you better have a riot. In Ephesus, the crowd was out to kill Paul, and Priscilla and Aquila saved his life. Well, now, they were a special couple, Priscilla and Aquila. Now, my friends, I'm going to skip down a little bit. We've studied the lives of some great ladies. Eve, yeah, and Sarah, and Hatshepsut, and Jochebed, Miriam, Vashti, Esther, Ruth. We salute them. Mary, the mother of Jesus. Mary Magdalene. Mary, the sister of Martha. Tabitha, Phoebe, and Priscilla, listen to me. These are history's great game changers. They are the mighty women. And we salute them. And we say, God bless them. Everyone, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God for the ladies. Time. It takes only a minute to have eternal life. How can you get saved in a minute? It's simple. First, believe that Jesus was the Son of God. Second, accept his free gift of eternal life. And then, you're saved. It's not hard. It doesn't take any time. You can be saved in a minute right now. Pray with me. Lord God, I realize that I am a sinner. My sin has separated me from you. I accept that your son, Jesus Christ, died for me. I ask Jesus into my heart. If you prayed this prayer, you are saved. The next thing to do is tell someone, fellowship with other followers of Jesus, get baptized, read your Bible and pray. Choices, we make them every day, all day. The most important choice you will make in your life is whether to choose eternal life or let it pass you by. If you'd like more information about your new life, call the number and visit our website. For a copy of today's program, please contact us at P.O. Box 1900, Thousand Oaks, California, 91358. Or in Australia, contact us at P.O. Box 861, Terrigal, New South Wales, 2260. This program is made possible through the generous support of viewers like you. We thank you for your continued support. May God richly bless you.